Hello and welcome to part two on our lecture series on the European Age of Exploration here on Learning the Social Sciences. So in our last episode, we did discuss why Spain and Portugal got on their ships and tried to head east via going west. Well, of course, there is that search for kind of gold, God, and glory. You want the gold because they do have problems with the trade coming from the east, coming from China, coming from the Indian Ocean trade routes, because middlemen keep increasing the cost up to 40%. So we have issues there where they want to go out and find their way to get to these items so that they can bring them back themselves and not pay the middleman price. However, once they start discovering or exploring areas that Europe was not knowing existed, they then start looking for gold or more appropriately for this time period, silver. There is also that push to spread their religion for the God piece. And of course, for all these explorers, there is this little bit of glory part that is mixed in. So we have all of this coming together along with that Renaissance curiosity. And Europe then gets on their boats and starts to head out. But be, to be able to do that, you need to finance it. Insert he Prince Henry the Navigator. So he is technically a, a member of the royal household of Portugal, but he's so far down the list, he's never going to serve. Um, it is something like if you were to take modern day, uh, Prince Harry, um, even though he has really given up a lot of his titles, but somebody that even if he still maintained all of them, he's most likely never going to serve as an actual king of the United Kingdom. So Prince Henry the Navigator, instead of ruling paid a lot of people to go and do explorations. So he financed a lot of expeditions, primarily along the west coast of Africa. Now he does have this motivation to get gold. So that is in there. But with all of his finances, he's able to usher in a new era of exploration. For him, he's kind of like the Lorenzo de Medici of boats. Lorenzo de Medici for art, and Prince Henry the Navigator for boats. However, he does have a tarnish to his record because he is somebody who did finance the uh, trips where we have the first people coming as slaves from West Africa to Portugal and the situation where one person said that if you have him go back home, I am a king and I will help get other slaves for you. And it is the start of what will become the transatlantic um, slave trade. So that obviously is a major blemish on Prince Henry the Navigator. However, the Portuguese are out and exploring. We have Bartholomew Diaz, who was the first European to round the southern tip of Africa in, in 1488 and actually do it again because he got back home. You know, you can do it once, but if you sink trying to come back, then nobody actually knows that you did it the one time. Um, anyway, getting around the Cape of Good Hope was precarious experience. The waves are choppy, the winds are there, and a lot of ships go down. But when he is able to do that, he opened up the way for a sea route from Europe to Asia. Following in suit, Vasco da Gama completed an all-water route to India in 1498. Now, this is a huge blow to the Italian monopoly on trade because now the Portuguese can get to India and get the items themselves, load their own boats, and bring them back to the Portuguese markets without the Italians ever touching the items. So a new market has now opened up. We also have Amerigo Vespucci who explored Brazil and was the first European to realize, hey, I think this is a new continent. I don't think I'm out east. And that is why we have the Americas, not the Colombians. Yeah. Anyway, jumping over to the Spanish. Uh, we can start with there with Christopher Columbus. He did reach the Bahamas in 1492, but he believed it was the West Indies. And he went to his deathbed believing that he had gotten to the East. That's why it's America, because Vespucci, he wins with figuring out what was going on. 
Anyway, Christopher Columbus um, conducted four expeditions and started the new era of European exploration in what the Europeans called the New World. However, he does have a lot of controversy. Uh, you can just look at it with Bartholomew de las Casas. Who is he? Well, he's a priest and former conquistador who publicly criticized the ruthlessness of Columbus. And he went before monarchs to speak about the treatment of the people by Columbus in the Americas. He was disgusted and appalled with what he saw. And he possibly would have made some change. But unfortunately, the King of Spain passed away shortly before meeting with him to have a more thorough investigation as to what was going on. To summarize De La Casas, I'm going to use one of his quotes. What we committed in the Indies stands out among the most unpardonable offenses ever committed against God and mankind, and this trade in Indian slaves as one of the most unjust, evil, and cruel among them. Of course, he has many quotes that you can go and look up to see exactly what he witnessed and what he tried to tell Europe. Jumping to other Spanish explorers, we have Vasco Nunez de Balboa, who in 1513 crossed over the Isthmus of Panama to find the Pacific Ocean lying on the other side. For the Europeans, this now proved that there was another ocean on the other side. However, they could have just continued to ask the population that was there if there was another great ocean. Uh, Ferdinand Magellan was the first to circumnavigate the globe by a technicality. His crew kind of was the first to do it in one trip uh, because uh, Ferdinand Magellan died along the way. Yes, he was able to travel from Spain all the way over to the Philippines where then he will get uh, involved in a local feud and he will be killed. However, when he sailed under the Portuguese flag, he was over in um, the east and going over to what they called the Spice Islands, which technically put him at the same lines of longitude to actually make him the first to circumnavigate the world just on two different voyages. Now, this is kind of big because when Magellan's crew was able to circumnavigate the world on this one trip, it calls into question the Treaty of Tordesillas. What is that? Well, this treaty happened because it seemed like Spain and Portugal were going to go to war against each other because they were both claiming a lot of land. Um, now, the Pope gets involved because he doesn't want to see these two rising superpowers in Europe going at it. And they create this treaty where they basically cut the world into pieces and say, you get this part and you get this part. That is why we have Brazil speaking Portuguese today, because as the line went, Brazil was in the Portuguese territory. So that is that. However, now with people circumnavigating the globe, what would be Spanish waters and what would be Portuguese waters? And well, now to further co add complexities to this, what about the Netherlands? What about England? What about France? There's a whole bunch of other nations getting into their boats and going places. So the Treaty of Tordesillas was really good at preventing a war when it was cre created. However, over time, things are going to change. Now, jumping into the Americas and what is going on there. We have talked a little bit about Columbus there, but now we're going to fast forward in history to Cortez. Cortez landed at Tabasco in 1519 without permission from the Spanish crown. He had 500 soldiers, 100 sailors, and 16 horses. Now, Cortez defeated the local American Indian groups on the coast and was given a female slave who spoke Aztec and Maya. And with that, he would be able to have a translator with him at all times. Now, Cortez learned of strife within the Aztec Empire and headed towards the capital, gaining allies along the way and doing a few battles along the way as well. When he and his now 1,000 soldiers arrived at the capital, they were invited into the city where they then kidnapped Montezuma II and started to take control. However, they learned that the Spanish 
we're landing at the coast to kind of say, hey, Cortez, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be here. So the Spanish left to head to the coast to fend off the other Spaniards that were there. And during this time period, the Aztecs rebelled, but the Spanish and the allies fought back, killing Montezuma and defeating the empire. However, a far greater disaster happened right after that. Smallpox hit the Aztecs and ravaged their population and made it to the point where they really could not fight back against the Spanish. Now, we are going to see something repeat itself with the collapse of the Inca, except for we're just going to change some names. So Pizarro, um, a Spanish conquistador, headed into Inca territory of South America with a band of 180 conquistadors. Emperor Alawapa, who was the leader of the Inca, was consolidating his new power at the time, and he wanted to use the Spanish as an example. And so he invited them into the capital without having an army have weapons. He wanted to showboat. And, well, it's pretty dangerous when you don't have anybody standing with weapons. The Spanish attacked at this time and kidnapped Atahualpa, following the playbook of Cortez, and they held him for ransom. The Inca then gave the largest ransom in the history of the world to that point, but still they put Atahualpa on trial and executed him by strangulation. And just like the Aztecs, shortly after that, smallpox came in, and ravaged the Inca population, making it so that they themselves also could not go and challenge the Europeans. So the Spanish Golden Age is largely sponsored by what they are going to be now taking from the Americas. They went and conquered regions and subjugated their populations. They go and follow a mercantilist philosophy in the early 1500s and their colonies are sh just used to benefit Spain. They are mining gold and silver and they are having so much come in that for example they just go and fund a church in Italy to be built where the whole inside is gold leaf. Everything inside the statues, everything is just covered in gold because they actually caused inflation to happen by bringing in so much gold and silver so fast. So they also in, uh, create the encomienda system in the Spanish held ter territories. So the American Indians would work for an owner a certain number of days per week, but they would then retain some land for themselves. This is also why Spain is not going to be bringing in a lot of West African slaves, unlike what we are going to be seeing with the English colonies and the Portuguese colonies. They operate with that system, which still is full of injustices. Also within Spain, we are going to start to see a little bit of a challenge coming between the peninsulares, the people that were born on the peninsula, specifically the Iberian Peninsula of Spain, and those who are the Creoles, or the Spanish born in the new world to Spanish parents. There is going to be this new kind of class system coming up with peninsulares at the top and creoles one step down and that we're going to see have issues continue on now until we're going to be seeing the independence movements of the 1800s with mexico peru and others uh, we are also going to note that in the spanish americas very few women came to their colonies during the 16th century. We're not going to really see women arriving until the 17th century, which is going to also lead to, well, some problems. So that has been our lecture today with our part two on the European Age of Exploration. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.